Imagine if you had to risk your life just to get to the doctor, or to work, or the supermarket for that matter, all just because of a river. And how would you decide to send your daughter to school if she had to cross a river or something like this in order to get there? My path to becoming an engineer started early. Thanks to hours sitting around the dinner table, listening to my dad and uncles banter about literally changing the world around them, I grew up believing that engineers and builders were heroes. But despite having great role models, to actually make it through the math, the chemistry, and the physics courses, I defined my own sense of purpose and connection with people. So. Halfway through college, I made the wildly questionable decision <laughs> to buy a one-way plane ticket halfway around the world in search of that thing that really made me tick. So, little spoiler alert for you: I found it. Um, but more importantly, on the journey, I came across an idea that I believe has the power to transform the lives in every corner of the globe. My time in the South Pacific widened my metaphorical viewfinders. There was both far greater wealth and deeper poverty than I had ever experienced. For every all-inclusive beach resort, there were many more subsistence farming communities living far beyond the reaches of modern conveniences. And it was in one of these rural communities where my personal quest for connection was confronted at a collective level. Entire communities also experience the vastness of alone, all due to the simple lack of connection. I saw how a river can make the difference between kids going to school or not, mothers having attended births or not, and farmers being able to sell their goods at market or not. And, and what I didn't realize at the time, but I've now spent the last decade researching and experiencing, is that kind of isolation is actually a root cause of poverty, and that poverty is pervasive. Over one billion people lack year-round safe access due to the lack of transportation infrastructure. So that literally means that one in seven people. Live in a walking existence, and they cannot get to where they need to go. But I didn't actually know that when I went to Fiji. I was more bright-eyed, excited to find connection and community, maybe a little bit of sense of purpose.、Uh, so I decided to volunteer with the local chapter of the Breast Cancer Foundation. Some days, our little volunteer team. Would reach our intended destination to spread the word about the importance of early breast cancer detection, but a lot of times we wouldn't. And it was during one of these community visits where we were just walking down and we came across a footbridge, and I literally stopped in my tracks. In that moment, I saw kids coming back from school, and I knew. That their mothers were now more likely to get access to preventative healthcare measures like ours, and in the moments that followed, I imagined other communities around Fiji, and likely the world, that could be transformed simply by having connection. And on a more personal note, I saw an opportunity to use my skills and experience to build bridges, both figuratively. And literally. So that night, I go home, really excited, and Google search who builds pedestrian bridges in the developing world. <laughs> There were two hits. The first seemed far too legitimate to respond to a 20-something student, but the other was this guy in Virginia 
a retired developer turned philanthropist, now volunteer founder of an organization called Bridges to Prosperity. I called him up. Hi, Ken. My name's Avery. I'm an engineering student, and I'd really like to build a bridge with you. So do you have any experience building bridges? <laughs> that call didn't last long, but my wheels were already in motion. I decided to head back to the States to jump it back into that degree program. A few months later, Ken, it's me again. I've got four classmates, and we'd really like to design a bridge with you for an honors project. Hopefully, third time's charm. <laughs> Ken, it's Avery. We have support from the engineering department and a plan to fundraise enough money to get ourselves to South America and to actually build a bridge. So you guys need to know, for all my qualities, persistence has been both a blessing and a certain <laughs> curse. So our student team dove headfirst into the unfamiliar world of fundraising. And we spent countless hours after school learning how to translate those textbook lessons into designing something real. By the time we graduated, we had finally raised enough money to get ourselves to the Peruvian Andes to do the hard part, actually getting the thing built. Our time in Peru actually started really slowly, over many cups of tea with village elders, as we negotiated, how could we get community support for the project? And we began a number of routines. Like, every morning, we'd go down to the river, and we'd use rice bags to clean sand and gravel. And every afternoon, we would take turns walking up the top of the nearest mountain to get cell phone reception in order to coordinate for the other materials to be dropped, which is actually when the fun part began, because that nearest dropping point, that road, was a three-hour hike from our community in Yavina. So that meant every piece of timber and 80-pound bag of cement got to be hand-walked down a mountain, through a valley, and up a very steep hill to our site. We learned all kinds of tough lessons, especially about being so cautious in our design, which ultimately usually means you have more materials. It affected our construction schedule, our budget, and, frankly, <laughs> our, our lower backs as well. But we learned to use innovation in an engineering way on site. So we learned, how do you transport 200-foot-long cables, each weighing as much as a car? By first unspooling the cable and recruiting your friends to walk one by one down the mountain. To get that same cable across the river was another real engineering feat which required one swimmer, two guide ropes, three clamps, and four carabiners. We worked for weeks, side by side with the community, really trying to understand how they would do work without us. We dug anchor pits big enough to replant 100-year-old trees using picks and shovels. And we built 10-foot-tall towers, stone by stone, connected through a mortar mix of that sand, gravel, and cement. But it was at night. As we spoke with the mothers and the teachers, that the gravity of our efforts really took hold. We were in the community of Yavina to build the bridge to save this community from burying their children every rainy season as the rivers would swell, and passage to school would literally become life-threatening. We inaugurated the Yavina Community Bridge to lots of dancing and half-understood speeches. But before I even boarded that flight to return home, I knew my heart was still with the people of Peru. I decided to apply to graduate school to study how could we standardize these designs so we could build more bridges in places like Givina. Eventually, the day came and I was ready to share my findings, and I picked up the phone again, this time with a bit more of a serious proposition. Hey, Ken. 
It's Avery. I think we need to spread this mission of connecting rural people and rural communities around the world. And I guess that's where you say my journey really began. As with most entrepreneurial endeavors, uh, the journey between the idea and action is actually really tough. It felt like with every step forward, we would take two steps back. But over time, we really perfected our craft. We partnered with communities and governments around the world to build 270 bridges. <laughs> bridges which now connect nearly one million people. But it's not about the bridges. It's about the profound impact in the lives of each and every person that benefit from that connection. This summer, our partners at the University of Notre Dame completed a three and a half year longitudinal study comparing the effects of access to communities with a bridge compared to those without. Their findings were almost unbelievable. They found that in communities that had a bridge, that an increased income of over 30% as farms became more efficient and access to jobs became more available. That means that in that entire community, each and every family had 30% higher incomes, all because of one bridge. I mean, imagine, what would each of you do with 30% higher salaries? Sorry, I get kind of worked up here. And I think you're really, really excited. <laughs> get emotional. Um, so this matters immensely, certainly for families and community, but at a national level as well. Take, for example, Rwanda, the Switzerland of Africa, the land of a thousand hills. We partnered with the National Transportation Authority to survey all of the communities where, that were isolated. In total, we found there were 321 communities that lacked access due to the lack of a pedestrian bridge. We could build those structures and maintain them for less than $20 million over the next decade. But in return, when each of those 1.6 million people are connected, and they see even remotely the same level of economic prosperity that we found in that study. That will create over $100 million of new economic activity every single year. That roughly translates to each bridge paying for itself over five times over the first year alone, but they continue to serve for 30 years. Now, granted, I'm extrapolating impact data here, but even if you took half or a quarter, I believe last mile transportation connection should be at the top of every government's agenda and philanthropist's priority list because connecting the rural last mile will transform global supply chains, rural economies, and livelihoods alike. So, before I wrap tonight, I'd like to leave you with this. Poverty due to rural isolation is a crisis that we can solve in our lifetime. But it's not about the bridges. It's about Angelique in Uganda, saving hours off of her walk to safe potable water every day. It's about Mina in Nicaragua, a community health worker who can finally reach everyone in her community. And it's about Rosa, a mother in Bolivia that doesn't have to make the impossible choice between educating her daughter and keeping her safe. Because that is the power of connection. Thank you.